I wanted to do was just explore a little bit more of Siegfried Sassoon. And it took me into his books. He, 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 he wrote, the, um, he's very often done in schools and that sort of thing, memoirs of a pop, fox hunting man. It's a very thinly disguised um, autobiography. It's, it's, it's nominal, it's, uh, it purports to be fiction, but it's obviously fairly obviously a bi you know, uh, an autobiography. So I've got a few readings from that. And um, what I wanted to do was sort of co contrast this with um, when he's in the first of all memoirs of an infantry officer and just sort of pick up that kind of pre-1914 kind of idyllic mm. period, you know, the Edwardian times when I suppose we were at the apogee of empire, perhaps a little bit past it, because by the first decade of the 20th century, the Americans were economically, you know, becoming very, very strong and clearly were going to be the world power. Because he actually, after he'd been to university until the war, he didn't really do anything, did he? No, um, he, he didn't because he was in, from the upper classes. Well, he had, um, he, had, he had 400 a year, I believe. Well, there was a vast amount of money of in those days. That, that was a huge amount of money. You know, that would be a, a gentleman's... Yeah. A gentleman lived, lived he, comfortably on £400 a year. He lived, he lived with his mother, didn't he? he no, he didn't live with his mother. He lived with he an lived aunt. With um, he... Oh, he lived with an aunt? He lived with an aunt. Um, well, a, a, unless it's... Because he's, he's living with an aunt in, in the memoir, isn't he? In uh, the memoir, he lives with an aunt. Y yes, but he... he in the, in the uh, you know this which is a work of fiction maybe he did change things slightly he says here in the first page which I'm going to read to you that his mother and father died when he was young and he was brought up he went to live with an aunt oh yeah now I whether did read the beginning, whether yeah. that was true in fact you know I in fact was. I don't really know I think it was. Um, don't know if he he changed things here Although so he was left a bequest by an aunt and that's how he bought that. Big house he had at Hatesbury. Well, that would be his... His aunt had nobody else to leave her money to, and clearly she had servants, she had horses. Mm. He was from that strata of society. Mm. Never, Obviously a gentleman, I mean, you know, never done any actual work. It wasn't necessary. Um, so, uh, and this, this first... The beginning of the book, I think, really gives you the, the flavour of what it was to be bought up at that time in that sort of hmm. Edwardian period, which I think we look back to as a kind of a golden age before the world changed forever, uh, you know, well, post-1914. Um, and this is, um, it, as it says, it, it's a very kind of gentle memoir. It, it, is, it is clearly not... Uh, it's more than nostalgic. It's in in search of a you know this age that was finished on the you know when the first world war started that was gone forever. Um, after it was the war that ended the peace, mm. and the peace had been from eighteen fifteen, very nearly the Battle of Waterloo. So very nearly a hundred years of peace as far as this country was concerned. So everything changed on. On that, well, uh, as, the, in as much as there had never been fighting here, but I mean, we fought plenty. I mean, there was a quite oh, yeah, I mean, the, the, there the were, you know, there's the Boer War, um, so on and so forth, but that was all overseas, yes. it was all to do with empire, but not, you know, in Europe, in our on our own backyard or for our own survival. Well, we hadn't had a war really since the Civil War, I suppose. Um, Are we? It was nothing, was it? Well, it set the war against France, which um, terminated in 1815 with the yeah, Battle of Waterloo. Yeah, but again, it wasn't... Well, it the was French would, would, you know... Are you talking about it wasn't on English soil? On yeah, English... It wasn't, oh, yeah. Wasn't, it wasn't on English soil again, but um, obviously the French had... Uh, would would have uh, you know, wanted the conquest of Britain if they if Napoleon could have added us to the list. Yeah. It would have been fine, rather as Hitler did, you know, a couple of hundred years later. Um... But um, so th this is that kind of, and, and the writing and the, the tone of this is, is just yeah. exploring yeah. that age. So um, anyway, I just picked this from chapter one. I've got a couple more readings from further on in the book just to give you an idea of how his life as a young man um, with money, mm. um, with time, what he did to, to, for his time, with his time. So, 
Early days. My childhood was a queer and not altogether happy one. Circumstances conspired to make me shy and solitary. My father and mother died before I was capable of remembering them. I was an only child, entrusted to the care of an unmarried aunt who lived quietly in the country. My aunt was no longer young when I began to live in her comfortable old-fashioned house with its large untidy garden. She had settled down to her local interests, so seldom had anyone to stay with her, and rarely left home. She was fond of her two Persian cats, busied herself sensibly with her garden, and was charitably interested in the old and rheumatic inhabitants of the village. Beyond this, the radius of her activities extended no further than the eight or ten miles which she could cover in a four-wheeled dog cart driven by Tom Dixon, the groom. The rest of the world was what she described as beyond calling distance. Dixon was a smart young man who would have preferred a livelier situation. It was he who persuaded my aunt to buy me my first pony. I was then nine years old. My aunt had an unexplained prejudice against sending me to school, so I remained at home until I was twelve, inefficiently tutored by a retired elementary schoolmaster, a gentle, semi-clerical old person, who arrived every morning, taught me a limited supply of Latin, and bowled lobs to me on the lawn. His name, which I have not thought of for I don't know how many years, was Mr Starr. Apart from my aunt's efforts to bring me up nicely, my early education was exclusively controlled by Mr Starr and Dixon, who supplemented Mr Starr's lobs with his more intimidating overarm bowling, bowling and never lost sight of his intention to make a sportsman of me. For the vaguely apologetic old tutor in his black tailcoat, I felt a torrent affection, but it was Dixon who taught me to ride and my admiration for him was unqualified. And see, since he was what I afterwards learnt to call a perfect gentleman's servant, he never allowed me to forget my position as a little gentleman. He always knew exactly when to become discreetly respectful. In fact, he knew his place. I have said that my childhood was not altogether a happy one. This must have been caused by the absence of companions of my own age. My Aunt Evelyn was full of common sense and liked people, children included, to be practical in their habits and behaviour, used to complain to Mr Starr that I was too fond of mooning aimlessly about by myself. On my eighth birthday she gave me a butterfly net and a fretwork saw, but these suggestions were unfruitful. Now and again she took me to a children's party given by one of the local gentry. At such functions I was awkward and uncomfortable, and something usually happened which increased my sense of inferiority to the other children, who were better at everything than I was, and made no attempt to assist me out of my shyness. I had no friends of my own age. I was strictly forbidden to associate with the village boys, and even the sons of the neighbouring farmers were considered unsuitable, though I, was, uh, though I was too shy and nervous to speak to them. I do not blame my aunt for this. She was re merely conforming to her social code, which divided the world into people one would call on and people who were socially impossible. She was mistaken, perhaps, in applying this code to a small, solitary boy like myself. But the world was less democratic in those days, and it must not be thought that I received any active unkindness from Aunt Evelyn, who was tender-hearted and easy-going. So that's really just that flavour. So um, I'm just going to read you a little bit from um, The Hunt now. Just, uh... OK. Um, so he's a young man now. And um, he's now... He says this. Sitting by the schoolroom fire after tea on the last Saturday in November, I cleaned my almost new pipe for I'd taken to smoking, though I hadn't enjoyed it much so far, with a white pigeon's feather from the lawn. I'd got home early after a rotten half-day with a drumborough, that Dumbra, that's a, one of the local hunts. I'd had four days with them since the opening meet, and it was no use pretending that I'd enjoyed myself. 
Apart from the pleasure of wearing my self-consciously new clothes, he'd been up to Taylor in Savile Row to get his hunting outfit. That sort of money. Um, I returned home each day feeling dissatisfied. It wasn't so much that the hunt seemed to spend most of its time pottering around impenetrable woodlands, as that the other subscribers appeared to be unwilling to acknowledge my existence, except by staring me into a state of acute awareness of my ignorance of what was being done and how to do it. There was also the problem of Harkaway, who demonstrated more clearly every time I took him out, of, out that his stamina was insufficient for a hard day's hunting. It was only his courage which kept, kept him going at all. In spite, of, in spite of Dixon's efforts in the stable, the old horse was already, as he ruefully remarked, looking properly tucked up. And the long distances to the meets were an additional hardship for him. So this is one of his early horses, Harkaway. As I lit my pipe, I felt I ought to be blissfully reconstructing the day's sport. But there seemed to be no blissful details to reconstruct. The hounds had run fairly well for about half an hour, but very little of it had been in the open. And I'd been so busy hanging on to my excitable horse that I had only a hazy recollection of what had happened, except that Bill Jaggett had damned my eyes for following him too closely over the only jumpable place in the fence. Bill Jaggett was, to my mind, one of the horrors of the hunt. He was a hulking, coarse-featured, would-be thruster, newly rich, ill-conditioned and foul-mouthed. Keep that bloody horse well out of my way, was a specimen of his usual method of verbal intercourse in the hunting field. What with the vulgarly horsey cut and colour of his clothes and the bumptious and bullying manners which, ma which matched them, he was no ornament to the Dumbra hunt. To me he was a positive incubus, for he typified everything that had alarmed and repelled me in my brief experience of fox hunting. Except for the violent impression he had made on my mind, I should have said nothing about him. But even now I cannot remember his behaviour without astonishment. He was without exception the clumsiest and most mutton-fisted horseman I have ever observed. <laughs> no horse ever went well with him, and when he wasn't bellowing at his groom, he was cursing and cropping the, the frothing five-year-old which was carrying his fifteen-stone carcass. He usually rode young horses since he fatted himself he was making them to sell at a profit. But it was short-sighted, he frequently fell on his head and gave me the satisfaction of watching him emerge from a ditch, mud-stained and imprecating. He took no interest in anything except horses and hunting, and it was difficult to believe that he had ever learnt to read or write. You see how snotty you can be being upper class with somebody who's not quite kosher. Uh, I'll tell you a story about this in a minute. Um, he, he, was, he was one of those small contingent who fancied themselves as hard riders. Owing to the character of the country, they always had to be looking for something to jump, whether the hands were running or not, and they were often in trouble with Lord Drumborough for larking over unnecessary fences. If this, in this they were conspicuous, for the other followers of the hunt were a pusillanimous lot of riders. There was always a queue of them at the gaps, over which they bobbed and bounced like a flock of sheep. You'd get that lovely picture in your mind's eye, can't you? You know, with their the, the top hats. Musing on my disappointing experiences, I decided that next week I'd go and have a day with the Potford Hounds, who were no further off than Dumborough. They were said to be short of foxes, but Dixon had heard that their new master had been showing good sport. Okay, so that's a taste of his fox hunting. Days. <laughs> but you see how this class thing is absolutely yeah. totally stratified all the way through um it's a wonderful story i, I must tell you this because it, it reminded me of it there was um a move a few years ago um, in the the beaufort and the barclay hunt up in gloucestershire we were living up there at the time yeah. and they thought we mustn't get the reputation of having the um you know the hunt just for people of a certain kind of background you know, upper class, public school educated, pots of money, estates in all over Gloucester, that sort of thing. So they decided to widen it out, you know, and well, everybody's welcome, you know, the plumbers, the electricians. Oh, inclusivity. Inclusivity. Oh, wow. No, no, before, this, 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 this was before actually... Before it was invented by the left. This, this was actually some <laughs> years ago. 
uh, uh, this apparently is, is near enough a true story. <laughs> um, and so the master of the Barclay, you know, invited all these people along, you know, pretending to, that they were all enjoying it and, 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 you know, looking forward to having them on the hunt. The, you know, the, you know, the plumbers who made their huge amounts of money and all that kind of thing. And um, they all went out for a hunt one day, um, everybody, and they came back. The master of the Barclay took one of the tradesmen, you know, aside. He said, excuse me, old boy, I hope you don't mind me saying this. He said, but when you see the fox, you should say, tally-ho the fox. Not, I'll have you, you little red bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, sorry, I couldn't resist that. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, um, I, I can I could we go on do, to do you? The, do, no, Just no, no. So I finished this. this. Shows, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. there's another two readings. I, 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 I don't want to. Oh, two readings. Another, but you only short the same book. Right. And then I'll, I'll, I'll be. Um, so I'm picking up the time now. These days are over. The First World War has started. He's now become a young officer, you know, um, in the cavalry, or well, he's mounted anyway. And the next bit is uh, crossing the channel. So there's this transition from being a sort of a callow youth um, into the, you know... He was about 30 when the war started, wasn't he? He was, so, yes, he was, yes, he was. He wasn't young, he's, young. No, he was born, oh, I think the same year, my grandfather was 1869. No, he was born later than that. He was about it was a bit later 18, than that. He was probably born 1884, I think, something Somewhere like that. Somewhere about there. Mm. I can't remember how it's actually. He was about 30, I think, when the war started. Mm. Uh, so, this is... Um, yeah. Um, it's The title of the chapter is At the Front. So obviously they've got to cross the, the channel um, to, uh, to get there. And he has a great friend of his, his name is Dick Tiltwell, and they big buddies, you know, they're sort of, they're, they're sort of soul mates, he's based, brother officer. He, I think he was based on, oh, was it a Welsh guy he knew? In real life? In yes. Real life it was a, and he, he does get killed. He gets killed early on, actually, yeah. in, in, and, and, and yeah. uh, it's, it's a big blow for um, mm. Sassoon. Wasn't that in the film? Mm. Or was that Wilfred? No, that, no, I don't think, no, no, that was... Yeah, Wilfred. that's Wilfred Owen. No. Oh, right. I don't know, anyway. So, um, here we are, and, and this is, the, the, they're off to war, and, you know, the, those Halcyon days mm. are now gone. It's, it's the grim reality. Uh, so his friend Dick. Dick and I were on our way to the 1st Battalion. Um, the real war, that big bullying bogey, had stood up and beckoned to us at last. And now the base camp was behind us with its overcrowded discomforts that were unmitigated by esprit de corps. Still more remote, the sudden shock of being uprooted from the camp at Cleveland and the strained 24 hours in London before the departure. For the first time in our lives we had crossed the channels, the very first time we went abroad. We had crossed in, a bright moonlit, in, in bright moonlight on a calm sea, Dick and I sitting together on a tarpaulin cover in the bow of the boat, which was happily named Victoria. Long after midnight, we had left Folkestone, had changed our course in an emergency avoidance of Boulogne, caused by the sinking of a hospital ship, we heard afterwards, had stared at Calais Harbour and seen sleepy French faces in the blear beginnings of November daylight. There had been the hiatus of uncertainty at Etape, four sunless days of north wind among pine trees, while we were waiting to be posted to our battalion. And now, in a soil, soiled, fawn-coloured first-class compartment, we clanked and rumbled along, and everything in the world was behind us. The Victoria Station, Aunt Evelyn's last desperately forced smile, and Dick's father, Canon Tiltwood, proud and burly, pacing the platform beside his slender son and wearing cheeriness like a light, unclerical overcoat, which couldn't conceal the gravity of a heart heavy as lead. What did they say to one another, he and Aunt Evelyn, when the rain had snorted away and left an empty space in front of them? 
to have finished with farewells, that in itself was a burden discarded, and now there was nothing more to worry about. Everything was behind us, and the 1st Battalion was in front of us. He was, in fact, an officer in the 1st Battalion, Royal Welsh Fusiliers, as you probably mm. know. I know he was in the Fusiliers. Um, at at um, nine, nine o'clock, we were none of us looking over bright, for we paraded with kit at two in the morning, though the train in its wartime way hadn't started till three hours later. There we sat, Dick and I, and Mansfield, at last released from peacetime army conventions, and Joe Barless, a gimlet, moustached ex-sergeant major, who was submitting philosophically to his elevation into officerdom, and spat on the floor at frequent regular intervals. On our roundabout journey, we stopped at St. Paul and overheard a few distant bangs, like the slamming of a heavy door, they sounded. Barless had been out before. He had been hit at the first Battle of Ypres, had left a wife and family behind him, knocked his pipe out and expectorated with a grim little jerk of his bullet head when he heard the guns. We others looked at him for guidance now, and he was giving us all we needed in his taciturn, matter-of-fact way until he got us safely reported with the 1st Battalion. It felt funny to be in France for the first time. The sober-coloured country all the way from Etap had looked lifeless and unattractive, I thought. But one couldn't expect much on a starved grey November morning. A hopeless hunting country, a hopeless hunting country it looked. The opening week would have been last week if it hadn't been for this war. Dick was munching chocolate and reading the Strand magazine with his cosy reminder of London traffic on the cover. I hadn't lost sight of him yet, thank goodness. The adjutant at Clitheroe had sworn to do his best to get us both sent to the 1st Battalion together, but it was probably an accident that he had succeeded. It was a lucky beginning, anyhow. What a railway-tasting mouth I'd got. A cup of coffee would be nice, though French coffee tasted rather nasty, I thought. We got to Béthune by half past ten. So this is the start of, you know, that... Um, moving up to the front. Just one thing on Folkestone, another little personal anecdote here. My grandmother on my father's side, um, uh, my, my father's mother, was one of four uh, sisters. They were Irish, Protestant Irish, and her, one of her sisters did something very shrewd. She came, most of them came, came to this country, you know, to marry their husbands and so on and so forth. But she set up a pub in Folkestone very early in the First World War and made a fortune. Oh. Did she? Because, of course, the troops all in the anyway. troops going through, mm. you know, on the, for their last pennies, you know, they were going to absolutely get themselves legless, weren't they? Um, but apparently she, she, she did very fast. She was a lovely lady, too. She was... As a child, we used to go to Folkestone on holiday when I was four, five, six, seven, that, that kind of age. She used to have a, uh, she had a big house on the Lees in Folkestone. Anybody who knows Kent or knows, it's the place. It's right on the cliffs overlooking the sea. She had this huge house up there and as a kid, it was, oh, the excitement. We're going to Folkestone for our summer holiday. Mm. But that's where she made her money. Very clever. <laughs> Very clever. So when I, when I see Folkestone, I always think, I th think of that. Um, one more from me and then I'll... I'll um, and it's the, the death of Dick. So uh, let me just read you that. It's not very far away. Dick's gone. Dick Tiltwood, oh. his great buddy, gets... It was terrible with the men that died. Just... Gets killed early... One, one, uh, it was 25% death. And the men who went, there was a 25% chance he wouldn't come home. Oh. Which is really high. That is very high. Um, and it's just, I said, just this little vignette. Um, uh, he, he's, his friend Dick has gone off somewhere. And then um, this happens. Coming up from the transport lines at 12 o'clock next morning, I found Joe Doctoral standing outside the quartermaster's stores. <clears throat> I presume he was a brother officer. His face warned me to expect bad news. No news could have been worse. Dick had been killed. He'd been hit in the throat by a rifle bullet while out, with a, while out with the wiring party and had died at the dressing station a few hours afterwards. The battalion doctor had been a throat specialist before the war, but this had not been enough. 
The sky was angry with a red smoky sunset when we rode up with the rations. Later on, when it was dark, we stood on the bare slope just above the ration dump while the, while the brigade chaplain went through his words. A flag covered all that we... Sorry. A flag covered all that we were there for. Only the white stripes of the flag made any impression on the dimness of the night. Once the chaplain's words were obliterated by a prolonged burst, burst of machine gun fire, when he had finished, a trench mortar canister fell a few hundred yards away, spouting the earth up with a crash. A sack was lowered into a hole in the ground. The sack was death, Dick. I knew death then.